God is here, though we cannot see him with the physical eye, he is here. I thank my dear friend Mike for extending the invitation to me to deliver what may be a very difficult message to hear. I made a commitment to God a long time ago that whatever he makes clear to me to say, I must say it. Risking relationships, resources, and reputation. And Mike has always entrusted me in places where it felt a little daunting for me to stand before the crowd at times. But tonight I want to say from the bottom of my heart how much I appreciate him for continuing to invite me back. Now that may change tonight. <laughs> uh, greetings to President Andy. We're grateful for your presence and for this great university. David and his God. In David, there is the powerful upward pull towards the heart of God, as well as the downward drag towards the moral weakness found in the human condition. In David, we see the bipolar pull between heaven's sanity and humanity's insanity. In David, we see the flawed and lowly creature yearning to be in righteous relationship with the Holy Creator. David's desire to please God is clearly exposed to the penetrating eyesight of the God who sees beyond the veneer of flesh straight into the hearts of his chosen servants. God saw David tenderly tending sheep on the backside of obscurity before God plucked him from the privacy of the sheep pasture and publicly positioned him on Israel's throne. Despite David's family ranking of being the last and the least, God knew he would be the chosen one to lead his people. David's sheep tending equipped him with the tender touch needed to deal with Saul's jealous rage and to shepherd the people of Israel. God saw something in David that Samuel and Jesse initially overlooked. Samuel saw David's physical appearance, but God saw an inner attraction in David that caught the heartstrings of the divine lover. And 1 Samuel 16, it says, he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Samuel's human eyes could not peek beneath David's physical qualities to detect the full scope of David's complicated character. At that moment, the prophet did not see that despite the attractive appearance, one tragic day, David's sinful proclivity would ignite in the public square in the form of a scandalous cover-up of an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. Samuel knew David's name, but God knew David's nature. Samuel knew David's personality, 
But God knew David's proclivity. Samuel knew David's physicality. But God knew David's spirituality. Samuel knew David's family. But God knew David's future. God said to Samuel, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God chooses leaders with specific considerations in mind that differ from the qualifications that people have in mind when they select their leaders. When choosing a leader, God looks at the heart. People look at the art, the art of persuasion, the art of war, the art of self-defense, the art of seduction. God chooses leaders that desire to do the will of God. People select leaders that promise to do the will of the people. God selects leaders that seek divine approval. People select leaders that are obsessed with approval ratings and poll numbers. Early in Israel's history, God expresses supreme displeasure at the idea of his people being under the despotic rule of merciless monarchs. God served Israel as king since the day he liberated them from Egyptian bondage. God then set up an egalitarian form of government among the Israelites designed to preserve and to protect their freedom from ambitious leaders thirsty for power and control. The judges were called freedom fighters. The God who had broken the back of brutal bondage in Pharaoh's Egypt was now seen as unfit to lead the captives whom he had set free. Because of the rising influence and success of the surrounding nations, Israel desired a visible king that would focus on Israel's special interest and would serve as a storm front to protect them from their enemies and to preserve their people from genetic extinction. The fear-based cry for a king becomes the critical turning point in Israel's egalitarian history in terms of her freedom. Instead of seeking God for protection, security, prosperity, and safety, Israel started to rally around a singular individual and began to view him as their great savior. The same God, the Hebrew people cried out for deliverance from a foreign king in Egypt, was now demanding the appointment of a domestic king from among their own people to rule over them. God tells Samuel to warn Israel about this dangerous desire for a king and to tell them what will happen when they look to worldly princes for their protection. Warn them about the freedoms that they will be required to give up in exchange for a false sense of security. They are seeking security from a king who himself is running over with manic depression and melancholic insecurities. God said to Samuel, Warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve him with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots, and he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and Give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male 
and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us to go out and before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord, and the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. When a nation looks to a human being as its sole source of national security and well-being, that nation opens itself up to the floodgates of tyranny. Even the founding fathers of the United States of America expressed their distaste for what they deemed as the king's abuse of power. The Declaration of Independence states in the second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and if they were living today, most likely they would say all men and women are created equal. Help me, somebody. <laughs> that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There seems to be an intelligent ignorance of these self-evident truths in our nation today. Americans have more intelligence in their hands than we have in our heads in the form of smartphones. <laughs> we are losing the mental capacity to believe that the divine creator has endowed us with certain inalienable rights Stephen L. Carter describes this state in our nation as the culture of disbelief. Without belief in the divine creator, we lose touch with the connective tissue that holds humanity together. Without belief in the divine creator, we lose appreciation for a collective altruism. We lose focus on a sound doctrine of human rights and we lose a commitment to the pursuit of the ideal of human equality. Justice, compassion, altruism, and human dignity are the required materials we need in order to construct the beloved community that we once envisioned when we stood together as a nation under the eloquent voice of Martin Luther King Jr. at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. in 1963. Without a belief in the divine rights embodied within human rights, a society drifts into an imbalance of power that results in the tyrannical consolidation of power into the hands of the very powerful. The country is experiencing a horrific erosion of memory loss of the divine creator. Tyrants and strong men actively seek to exploit this national memory loss by filling the citizens' mental vacancy with worship and praise of twin dictators that partner under the white sheets of global racism. Tyrants entrusted with great power brag about the thousands they have slaughtered, the tens of thousands they have starved to death, and the millions they are prepared to burn to death through a nuclear incinerated nightmare. Tyrants and dictators deny human rights to others while they assign to themselves the divine rights of kings. They believe they possess the copyright on divinity and therefore have the right to create their citizenry in their own image. Tyrants, dictators, despots, and kings have always been a threat to freedom, equality, and human rights. The founding fathers believed that the greatest threat to liberty and freedom at that time that they wrote the Declaration of Independence was the British king. The following is the founding fathers' description in the Declaration of Independence of their view of how George III, the British king, had become a tyrant and how he was actively abusing his power. 
the founding fathers courageously wrote these words. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people who relinquish the right of representation in legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat our substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coast, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. They go on to write, he has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against the country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Those are the words of the founding fathers of this country. The founding fathers' description of British King George III sounds very much like what God warned Israel about in regards to the oppressive nature of kings. This description fits Saul and all tyrants like him as well-tailored suits. We see somewhat of a different spirit in David as king of Israel. Evangelist Luke describes the distinctive difference between King Saul and King David in this way. In Acts 13, 22, Luke says, after removing Saul, he made David their king. And God testified concerning him I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. God said that David is a man after my own heart because David 
was willing to do everything that God wanted him to do. God did not say the same about Saul. Saul became Israel's king as a result of the will of the people. David, as king, unlike Saul, was more humble and more realistic about his sinfulness. David's tender heart for God is beautifully expressed in Psalm 51. David says, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Saul trivialized God's will and never saw the need to ask God to create in him a clean heart. When the leader of a nation functions with this type of arrogant disregard for David's God, it will eventually cause the society to run off the rails in terms of seeing any moral obligation to God or to the law. Tyrants and despots care nothing about being after God's heart. They are too puffed up with pride and power to ever admit their own inner wickedness because they are blind to their own internal evil they readily project their hateful energy onto others as scapegoats. Tyrants and despots have learned to operate independently of God through the masterful wizardry of political seduction. Even the very elect are drawn away by the seducing spirits of deceptive despots. Tyrants know that when a nation loses its affection for God, it will soon lose its aspiration for freedom, life, liberty, and justice. Like a snake's poisonous venom, it moves gradually through the polarized veins of a body politic until it brings about the fatality of a democracy through the calculated dismantling of democratic institutions. The maintenance of freedom in any society will require a renewed awareness of the divine creator as a collective reverence for the indestructible values of David's God. We must once again seek David's God if we are to properly apply the makeup and the mascara of love, compassion, and justice on the beautiful face of this planet. We must seek after God's heart as David sought after God's heart. As we look into the low valleys and massive canyons, we behold the traces of his divine footprints. As we gaze into the starry lit skies during the night watch, we behold the sacred smudges of his fingerprints. The temporal and the tangible eloquently point to the mysterious womb out of which all of life has emerged, we are convinced that life did not give birth to itself. The voice of divinity, though it speaks in a whisper, reminds us that human beings are not the central focus in the enterprise of life. There is another who is higher. There is another who is greater. There is another who is wiser who stands at the center of all the universal activity within the arena of all of creation. God's kingly presence bends the powerful as well as the powerless into a humble posture of all. Those who sense his divine presence readily burst open with uncontainable joy. It is in the awareness of David's God that we discover the true source of our identity of our security and of our love. 
Paul Tillich describes the divine creator as the ground of our being. The divine creator's omnipresence is not limited to a limitless, unfilled outer space. His presence is inner spatial as well as outer spatial. The freedom fighters of old knew that when the people awakened to the awareness of their inherited endowments provided by the divine creator, tyrants would lose their power to intimidate, they would lose their power to manipulate, they would lose their power to seduce and dominate and to divide. When David's God occupies the inner region of the soul of his people, then the mind of that people will no longer be compromised by tyrannical lies and clever dishonesty. Tonight, we honor David's God. In God's presence, we will seek the righteousness of God until injustice is arrested and the miscarriage of justice is placed on death row. In God's presence, all that is dishonest and based on trickery will be exposed to the brightness of God's eternal light. In God's presence, the saints of God will sing through the broken hallelujahs until joy comes in the morning. In God's presence, we will break down the barriers that keep women in inferior pay positions and build the bridge that will allow the left and the right to intersect. Help me somebody. In God's presence, in God's presence, the resurrected spirits of Bull Connor and George Wallace will not be allowed to take us back to the days of church bombings and tree lynchings. Have I got a witness? In God's presence, we like the mighty man Samson will push apart the pillars of tyranny that thrive off of racial and religious apartheid. In God's presence, we shall overcome. In God's presence, we shall overcome fear because perfect love casts out fear. In God's presence, we shall overcome hatred because God is love. In God's presence, we shall overcome racial bigotry because truth crushed the earth shall rise again. In God's presence, we're going to reach out to hands that look different from ours because we're not going to get caught up in the color of our skin because we know that our relationship is based on the spirit that abides within. One of these days, one of these days, one of these days, our skin will not be able to accompany us. One of these days, everybody in here will look just alike because skeletons are identical. But we must be determined as the people of God to remember that these physical bodies are nothing more than rental cars. Help me now. That one day will have to be turned back into the owner. But what matters most is the kind of heart that we carry within these physical bodies. So much of the division that exists in our world today is based upon these two things here. Because many of us walk by sight and not by spirit. Don't judge me based on how my body looks. because I am not my body. You are not your body. When you look yourself in the eye, in the mirror, 
you must remember that there is something of God's own nature that exists behind those eyes, something that is eternal, something that death cannot kill and the grave cannot hold. You have to remember that you are more than skin, flesh, and bones. And so don't panic when these bodies start to age because they will. Young people, you're looking at your future. <laughs> but don't panic, because we know that these bodies are temporary, and so is our dwelling in this world. It is temporary. And so many people put so much energy and so much time and getting caught up in the temporary affairs of this world and we don't even know if God is going to allow us to see the next day. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the place where there will be no more racial strife and bitter bigotry and people competing for carnal power in the name of Jesus. I'm looking forward to the day when the Lord will step one foot on land and the other on the sea and will declare time to be no more. I'm looking forward to that city whose maker and builder is God. We have a lot of municipalities that are run by spiritual principalities, but there is a city whose maker and builder is God, where God is the mayor, Jesus is the mayor pro tem, the Holy Spirit is the city manager, and the 12 apostles sit on the city council. In that city, there are no mortuary is there. In that city, no doctors there. In that city, we don't need any weather forecasters because every day gonna be sunshine. We won't even need any clocks in that city that we get fixated on during the worship hour. Help me somebody. But we'll worship all day long sitting around the throne of God. Every tongue from under the heavens will be gathered together singing a new song. We have to remember, brothers and sister Christians, don't get caught up in the fist fight that's taking place in our country right now. We. We have to be the voice of spiritual reason. If we get in the fight and start swinging, we give up our right to be singing to the one who is the Christ. How can we sing that he is our Lord when we hate somebody because of their political affiliation? The church must be reclaimed by the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is not of this world. It's in the world, but not of the world. And we must be the salt in the light and to speak words of wisdom and peace when we sit at the Thanksgiving table, when the conversations come up and you hear your aunt and your uncle talking ugly talk about people that you know that look a certain way, be the voice of Jesus at the table. Don't just wait till you get to the Lord's table. Be the voice of peace and spiritual wisdom at the dinner table. And everywhere God allows you to set your foot, you are here 
for the main mission of being a peacemaker. If you are making war, if you are fighting for the joy of fighting, you cannot claim to be the follower of the Prince of Peace who told Peter, put up your sword because I don't have a kingdom that is of this world. I don't fight like that. And so as I try to go to my seat, I'm being pulled to the left and to the right. Amen. May God bless us as we keep our eyes on David's God and continue to cry out to him saying, create in me a clean heart. Everybody needs to pray that prayer because some of us forgot that our humanity's parents ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some of us act like we only got knowledge of good <laughs> and that everybody else is evil. It is not until we come to grips with both of those genetic com components of good and evil and we embrace all of that under the mercy of Jesus and say, create in me a clean heart until we can accept and experience the compassion of God on our own imperfection and fallenness, we will not have the mercy nor the grace nor the compassion on other people that we think are more evil than we are. But for the grace of God, there go I. May God bless us as we keep our hearts tuned into the heart of David's God. God bless you.